Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to episode 37 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. I'm so glad that you've joined me here. Now, this podcast is coming a little bit late this week. Usually it's available for download on um, Sunday, if the latest Mondays. But um, my husband and I actually just got back from a weekend trip to Santa Barbara, California, where we had a wonderful time. And so that's put me a little bit behind schedule, but for a very good reason. You know, we've never been to Santa Barbara before, even though it's only about a half a day's drive. And it was just beautiful down there. Um, The mission style architecture, it's tucked between the ocean and those beautiful mountains. And it's just like something out of a movie. It's it's very romantic and, and lovely. And the weather was beautiful. I kept seeing on the news that the whole country looked like it was in a snowstorm. And We were enjoying about 70 degrees on the beach, so (laughs) it was very, very nice. We were there to attend a concert by the band Venice, who sings the song Family Tree, that you will find in the video section of the Genealogy Gems podcast. I got a chance to sit down and spend some time with the band and talk to them about their song, their music, and their absolutely fascinating family. So you've got that to look forward to in the next episode of the podcast. The band consists of Kip and Pat Lennon, who are brothers, and their first cousins, Mark and Michael Lennon, who are also brothers. Now I'm going to give you a little sneak peek. I want you to listen to this clip and see if you can recognize the famous siblings of Kip and Pat and cousins of Mark and Michael. Did you recognize those beautiful voices? Tune in next week to learn who those beautiful voices belong to and learn more about this really amazing family. I'm very excited about that interview. Now this week on the Genealogy Gems news blog, uh, we have a new poll question. And this one is very simple. Do you listen to the podcast the week it is published? Yes or no? And I just thought that would be kind of interesting to know in terms of... um, how much stuff that I put in that's, you know, kind of pertinent to the week and how much needs to be a little more evergreen, if you will, because people may be listening to it down the road. And we're always getting new listeners, so we welcome those and want to make sure that the podcast is relevant to you no matter when you tune in. But it's kind of helpful to me to learn a little bit more about your listening habits. So I appreciate you going and checking that out. Just go to the genealogygems.tv website and click on blog, and that will take you there. And speaking of the blog, I'm wondering, have you already picked up your new 2008 calendar? I certainly hope so, because one of your first entries should be what you will find on my Genealogy Gems News blog this week. Uh, This is the week of December 18th of 2007, and the blog is about the Family History Expo 2008 that's coming up in St. George, Utah. 
And this two-day conference is absolutely jam-packed with national speakers and genealogy service providers, including your humble Genealogy Gems host. I'm going to be there, and I'm really looking forward to it. It's my first time attending the conference. Now, since pictures are worth a thousand words, I've put together a short video to take you on a kind of a visual tour of this year's conference. And you can find that video, as I said, at the Genealogy Gems News blog. Just go to genealogygems.tv, click on blog, and that'll take you over there and you'll find the video right there. Now, some of you guys have written and told me that you live in areas where high-speed internet is still not available. So I want to go ahead and play the audio from the video just to give you a taste of what you can look forward to at the Family History Expo on February 8th and 9th in St. George, Utah in 2008. My Ancestors Found and Family Search are pleased to present the fourth annual Family History Expo 2008, The Pirates of the Pedigree. This year's conference, formerly known as the Genealogy and Family History Jamboree, will be held February 8th and 9th, 2008, in beautiful St. George, Utah. This exciting event will be held at the Dixie Convention Center. Come learn how to find the family history treasures of your pedigree. This two-day event will draw speakers and vendors from all over the United States. And it will feature 101 classes plus more than 60 vendors and exhibitors displaying all the latest genealogy products, services, and technology. With FamilySearch as one of the major sponsors, this event will be beneficial to Latter-day Saints as well as those seeking to begin their family history research. The Church and Family History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is sending department heads to teach about the new Family Search that will be released in 2008. This information will be a sneak peek for attendees, highlighting new tools that will help researchers increase their ability to connect with other researchers, access online documents, help index the growing number of online documents, and so much more. The event kicks off with keynote speaker Bo Sharbro, Vice President of Content at Footnote.com. Bo will expose those dirty pirates who try to rob us of the true gems that unfold a fabulous family tree. At the Friday evening banquet, sponsored by the Godfrey Memorial Library, genealogists and non-historians alike will enjoy Come Away With Me, a musical look at events that shaped America and the newly arrived immigrants to this country, performed by Jean Wilcox Hibben. Then spend two full days listening to nationally known speakers such as Megan Smolniak Smolniak, Arlene Eagle, Stephen Valentine, Dear Myrtle, Kimberly Savage, Janine S. Morgan, Jeff Rasmussen, Bruce Busby, Leland Meitzler, Galen Finley, Paul Nada, Lisa Louise Cook, and many more. The list of exhibitors at this conference also reads like a who's who in genealogy. The companies represented include My Ancestors Found, Family Search, World Vital Records, Ancestry.com, Family Tree Magazine, Footnote.com, Generation Maps, The Genealogy Gems Podcast, Roots Television, TheSpectrum.com, and Dear Myrtle. The Family History Expo is a very affordable event with even greater savings available through early bird registration before December 31st, 2007. Get all the latest conference news with the free newsletter at MyAncestorsFound.com. So mark your calendars and make plans to be part of one of the largest genealogy conferences in the nation, the Family History Expo, Pirates of the Pedigree. For more information, Go to www.myancestorsfound.com. Well, that's the audio from the, the new video that I've put up regarding the Family History Expo 2008. It's going to be a great event. And yes, I will be there doing my presentation, Google, a gold mine of genealogy gems. That's going to be on at 4.30 on Friday evening, February 8th, 2008. And I hope that you'll take a moment and stop by my booth in the exhibit hall to introduce yourself and say hi. That would be a real treat. So mark your calendars. I hope you'll be there. And now on to the mailbox. I got an email this week from Will Haskell, and he writes, Hi, Lisa. Thanks for the hint about looking at the next page of the passport photo. 
I could not figure out why my grandfather's passport application had a woman's photo with it. I actually have my grandfather's passport from when he went to China and Russia back in 1919. He went to Vladivostok, Russia, and worked as a public accountant for the YMCA. I have attached copies of the passport application pages for my grandfather, Merrill Haskell. And he says, I listen to your podcast while rowing on my indoor rowing machine. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you, Will. I keep telling you guys, if I could just figure out how to record this thing while I'm exercising, we'd all be in better shape. But uh, I'm glad you guys are. And um, I will have a page from his grandfather's passport on the show notes for this week, episode 37, because, uh, you know, it's funny, when I did that blog about the passport database and talked about it in the last week's podcast, I was thinking, oh, maybe I'm the only one who just didn't notice that there was, you know, possibly another page and didn't look forward. But no, I'm hearing from people that, um, you know, you get excited and you see something and you think, okay, well, that's it. And that's all there is. And and um, it's just always helpful to get that little nudge. So I'm really glad that that led to the finding the photograph of his grandfather. I hope you guys have checked out that database um, if you belong to Ancestry because um, it sure is neat to, to get a new photo of an ancestor that you haven't seen before. So thank you so much, Will, for writing and telling us about it. It's very inspirational, as well as making us feel like we need to get out and exercise now. <laughs> And hey, I wanted to mention to all of you, because I know a lot of you do go out and um, you're listening to the podcast while you're exercising, perhaps while you're walking or running or rowing as Will does. And I know I listen to a lot of my favorite podcasts um, while I'm out walking. So I wanted to just remind you about something that I actually had to remind myself about the other day. I had found a new podcast um, that had come out that really interested me. And I thought, okay, great. So I went in and I subscribed to it. And I plugged in my iPod and, you know, walked away and did something else because it takes a while. Well, I went out and went walking and I listened to the first episode of this episode and I thought, oh, that was great, you know. And then I realized I couldn't find any of the other episodes and I knew they, that this particular podcast had put out several. And I went back and I looked at iTunes again and, and I re realized that um, you do have to click the get all button. I've done this more than once where I've subscribed to a podcast and um, you have to, I think, the reason why this happens is that you have to click that subscribe button, get on board, it will download the first or actually the most recent episode, but you have to go back and either click get all or click for each episode that you do want selected and go back and select the past episodes. So I just kind of wanted to review that with you and remind you, particularly if you are new to Genealogy Gems, you're coming on board where there's already, you know, dozens of episodes already up and running on iTunes and available for you. So don't forget to go back, look at the Genealogy Gems listing, and make sure that you've got all of the episodes. This is number 37, so there should be 37 episodes there that are available for you to listen. And as I've said before, you know, I've tried to stay focused on things that are going to be helpful to you no matter when you listen to the podcast. I don't really focus a lot on the newsy items that are kind of current events. Those you'll find more on the Genealogy Gems news blog. So anyway, that's just a little quick reminder. And also for all of you who are either driving while you're listening or exercising while you're listening, that's why I do the show notes. You know, I was listening to that podcast the other day and I was thinking oh I wish I had you know pen and paper because <laughs> there were so many things he was mentioning and I was thinking oh you know I wanted to follow up on that and we have to remember that's what the show notes are all about so don't worry when you're listening and you're hearing ideas or getting inspirations for something just make it a habit to go back and check out the show notes because I really do cover all the highlights of the topics that I've talked about. I provide all the hyperlinks to all of the different websites I've referred to. And it can actually be a really great jog to your memory like, oh, that's right. I wanted to follow up on that and, and try that out myself. So utilize the show notes. They're a great resource. And I encourage you to do that with any podcast that you listen to. Um, because it can remind you about things that you um, heard. If you're like me, you know, it's a fleeting moment. It goes in one ear and five seconds later, I forgot what it was. So <laughs> anyway, that's going to be your little help for this week. And just a reminder um, to get the most out of the show that you can. So 
I think that's all our housekeeping. We're just going to jump right in to our first gem. Do you remember the old Wrigley Spearmint Gum commercial? And they would have like the double mint twins and they would say, two, two, two mints in one. Well, this is two, two, two searches in one. But this first gem is about polycola.com. It's P-O-L-Y-C-O-L-A dot com. And it is a really great new website that you can use to search both the Yahoo directory as well as um, Google. Why would you want to do this? Well, typically Google will come up with what you're looking for. But depending on how big the site is and how developed it is, sometimes what you're looking for might be buried or it might be a very small site and therefore it doesn't rank very high in Google's rankings. So the way to double check is to go to polycola.com and search for that item. The neat thing is, is you're going to get results for both Yahoo and Google side by side. And that's just a way to cover all your bases to make sure that you've um, found everything out there that you're looking for. So again, that's polycola.com. Give it a try and see if uh, you don't get a little more success with your next search. Well, since this is probably going to be my last episode before the Christmas holiday, I thought I would tell you a little story. And hang in there with me, because this is a story that would have affected not only your life, but very likely the lives of your ancestors. On a stormy December night in 1903, a postman named Enar Hobel was working late in a post office sorting large piles of Christmas mail. As he worked, he looked out the window at the outskirts of Copenhagen and noticed a ragged little girl and boy, and he saw them for just a moment until they disappeared into the swirling snow. Enar continued on with his work, and yet the deep contrast between the messages of Christmas cheer and goodwill and the letters and packages before him and the sad-looking children just outside his window really troubled him. As he sorted through the piles, he suddenly got an idea. What if every letter or parcel carried an extra stamp, and the money from the tens of thousands of these little extra stamps went to help unfortunate children? What a blessing it would be. The heavy burden would be light if it was carried by many. Well, the next morning, he told his fellow postal workers about it. They were enthusiastic and considered if it would be possible to start that very year. They began working out all the details to prepare for launching the effort during the 1904 Christmas season. When the Christmas rush was over and the plan was worked out, they went to King Christian IX and outlined their scheme. The well-loved king was so enthusiastic about it that he suggested that the first issue of seals would have Queen Louise's picture as a sign to his people that he and his wife fully were behind the effort. The seals went on sale during Christmas of 1904, and the campaign was even more successful than the postman had hoped. The Danish people bought four million seals. It was decided that the money raised would go to the thousands of children in most distress, those who were afflicted with tuberculosis. Hospitals were built, and the world saw how ordinary citizens could help fight an infectious disease. Well, the very next year, Norway and Sweden offered Christmas seals to their people, and by 1907, the idea had crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Miss Emily Bissell heard from her cousin, Dr. Joseph P. Wales, that a little sanatorium on the Brandywine River in Delaware was about to close for lack of $300, sending the patients, all of whom were infectious, out among others where they could spread their disease. Miss Bissell remembered a magazine article sent to her a while back telling about how the Danish people had begun to fight tuberculosis by buying seals to decorate their Christmas letters and cards. Miss Bissell decided that she would see if America would be willing to help in the same way. An artist friend helped her design a seal, a simple wreath of holly in the brightest red that the printer could find. Two women gave her twenty dollars each toward the cost, and a very kind printer named Charles Story agreed to go ahead and just trust her for the rest. Unfortunately, not everyone was so encouraging. 
Officials didn't like the idea of linking Christmas to a terrible disease, and in the end, postal authorities would not agree to let postmen sell the seals as they had in the Scandinavian countries. The campaign went so slowly that it was plain that the $300 needed was not going to be collected in time to keep the hospital from closing. Well, Miss Bissell did not give up. She went to Philadelphia and appealed to the news editor of the North American Daily Newspaper. Though the news editor refused to help, Miss Bissell did stop and tell a young columnist named Lee Mitchell Hodges about how much she enjoyed his column, The Optimist, and cautiously explained her dilemma. The young columnist rushed into the managing editor's office, tossed a sheet of the seals on his desk, and exclaimed, Here's a way to wipe out tuberculosis. His boss, Mr. Van Volkenberg, said, Tell Miss Bissell the North American is hers for the holidays. You drop everything else and put all your time on this. And get 50,000 of these seals in here. We'll sell them for her on the street floor. The seals were placed in small envelopes carrying the following words in red. 25 Christmas seals, one penny apiece, issued by the Delaware Red Cross to stamp out the white plague. Put this stamp with message bright on every Christmas letter. Help the tuberculosis fight and make the new year better. These stamps do not carry any kind of mail, but any kind of mail will carry them. Emily started her own one-woman campaign to publicize the seals and how donating them would help fight the battle against TB. She spoke to all sorts of groups, working overtime to make her campaign a great success. Finally, on December 7th of 1907, the first seals were sold at a table in the corridor of the Wilmington Post Office. And ultimately, the campaign resulted in over $3,000. It grew into a national program in 1908 by the National Association for the Study of Prevention of Tuberculosis and the American National Red Cross. The seals were sold at post offices, initially in, in Delaware, at one cent each and the net proceeds from the sales were divided equally between the two organizations. In 1920, the Red Cross withdrew from the arrangement and the SEALS campaign was conducted exclusively by the National Tuberculosis Association. The name was later changed in the 1960s to the National Tuberculosis and Respiratory Disease Association, and the NTRDA then became the American Lung Association in 1973. Today, the Christmas seals benefit the American Lung Association and other lung-related issues. Tuberculosis was declining, but according to the American Lung Association, it's actually been on the rise again recently. TB is still the most common major infectious disease in the world. Well, how many of us have noticed Christmas seals or used Christmas seals in our cards and letters and packages at Christmas time? I know I certainly have, and they always caught my eye because they were so adorable and colorful. When I was a little girl in about fourth grade, my teacher wanted to introduce our class to stamp collecting. And I remember that she put a box out on the counter at the local post office. And she would bring it back each week, and it would be filled with all kinds of stamps that people had donated. Now, me, I'm the rebel. I always kind of plowed past the, the stamps and would find the Christmas seals. They were so much more attractive to me, and, and each one was different every year, and I ended up saving and collecting them. And just the other day, I was thinking about Christmas seals as I received my first Christmas card, and, and there was the 2007 seal. And I thought, you know, I wonder if I still have that collection. Well, I do. And if you go to the Genealogy Gems website, again, genealogygems.tv, and click on the podcast button, you'll see there on the show notes a new video that I've put together. It includes the story that I just told you about the history of the Christmas seal and how our ancestors used them to each contribute in a small way to a very big cause. But also, you'll be able to see for yourself each Christmas seal since the very early days of the campaign. The artwork is terrific, and it's a very interesting walk through time and kind of what was popular at the time because the artwork definitely reflects the style. Everything from the old traditional to art deco to kind of that um, more cartoonish Disney look, you know, the 1950s. And, and the different motifs that were used really also reflect the times. So I hope you'll enjoy watching the video. It's just a couple of minutes long. And it'll give you a walk in time and, and, and actually get a chance to see the pictures of the seals that would have been on the letters of your ancestors, your grandparents and great-grandparents, 
when they first received Christmas cards with Christmas seals. It's really fascinating to me, actually, that this whole topic came up and that I decided to do a podcast about it because in doing my research for learning the history of the seals and pulling out my old collection, I came to find out that this is the 100th anniversary of the Christmas seal. It was in 1907 that they began, and this is 2007, so what could be more appropriate? I will have a link for you in the show notes to the American Lung Association where you can um, sign up to receive next year's seals and get involved in that very important work that they do. And I hope that you'll um, take a look at the video. And if you like it, I also have it available on YouTube where you can email it to a friend. And I hope that it will share a little Christmas cheer this season. We've come to the close of episode 37 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. I hope you enjoyed this week's tip about using Polycola to do a double whammy search on the internet, as well as our nostalgic walk through the history of the Christmas seal, which have graced the Christmas greetings of our ancestors as they still do today. It's wonderful how something so small can provide us each with a way that we can really help to make a difference. And speaking of making a difference, that's you, my friend. Thank you so very, very much for supporting the podcast by doing your Amazon shopping through the links on the Genealogy Gems website. By accessing Amazon.com through a link at genealogygems.tv, the podcast gets credit for any and all purchases that you make. And it doesn't change the price that you pay, and you're financially supporting the podcast that I am happy to provide free to you each week. It's been a great arrangement, and keep up the good work. You are terrific friends. And you have also warmed my heart as you have responded to my request for five-star ratings for the podcast in iTunes. We are closer and closer to the goal of 25 positive reviews by the end of the year, which I'm really excited about. We're up to about 19 now at last count. And if you have an iTunes account and you are enjoying the podcast, I invite you to join in and leave a five-star positive review, which helps other genealogists that are new to iTunes find and subscribe to Genealogy Gems so they can join in in the fun. One of the most recent reviews I got was just so wonderful, and I'm almost embarrassed to read it because it's, it's very flattering, but... Well, let me just read it to you, and I want to comment on it afterward. Um, The listener wrote, This podcast is like a visit from a friend each week. Lisa offers a great variety of items of interest for lovers of genealogy in a straightforward, easy listening manner. Historical music, projects to show off your family history, and neighborly advice are offered in each podcast. Well, I have to tell you, it was really a thrill to read this one because that's been my goal. My goal is um, to talk to you as my friend in genealogy to hopefully be straightforward and easy to listen to. And I love sharing ideas and the music and the projects and um, just all the excitement I have about doing family history. I know you have that too. And, and I'm humbled and thrilled if if in any way that that has come across to you in the podcast, you know, 2007 has been a very eventful year for me. And this podcast has just been a thrill to do. It's, it's so much fun. It's, it's a joy to get to know you guys. And it's just extra topping on the ice cream sundae if you're enjoying it as well. So thank you so much. And with that, I want to end this one because it's really been a perfect day. It's been so fun sharing with you my, one of my childhood favorite things, the Christmas seals and, and the story of that. Just being able to see how you guys have been so responsive in the last couple of weeks, particularly to the podcast. And so I think it would be very appropriate to end with the song at the end of a perfect day. It was written by Carrie Jacobs Bond. And at the dawn of the 20th century, this was the ultimate classic song. Every family knew it. Every family could sing it. And I'm going to play for you Sterling Holloway, who was singing the song, and you would know him because he is the voice of Winnie the Pooh in the Disney movies. He sings the song in in really one of my favorite Christmas movies, which is Remember the Night, with Barbara Stanwyck accompanying him on piano. So with that, dear friend, uh, enjoy the song, and I will look forward to talking with you next time. Have a great week. 
I can play a piece. I used to play in the 10 cent store. But that'd be nice. I can sing the end of a perfect day. Willie. No, I can't. Well, so can everybody else. Come on, Willie, sing. Oh. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. 